Anyway, so I just introduced Michael. Michael is uh, Michael O'Dwyer. He's uh, how we know him from uh, Murphy Jewelers. He's uh, a jeweler, a uh, goldsmith, and um, very talented. But I suppose I wanted to um, Michael to talk about his biking and packing adventures around Sweden and the world. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to Michael. He's obviously a, a native of Ireland, living in Sweden, like he said there earlier, for 13 years. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Cool. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is a, uh, a type of cycling called uh, bikepacking. What, what is bikepacking? Bikepacking is kind of like, so we, we all know what cycle touring is. It's, you know, people load up their bicycles with panniers and they cycle around Ireland or Europe or so on. And um, the bikes are quite heavy and they're really built to cycle along like asphalt roads, like normal roads. That, that's what bike touring is. Bike packing is quite a new kind of sub sport. And what it is, it's meant for more adventurous cycling where we would cycle, try to cycle as much as possible off of the asphalt roads, uh, more sort of on gravel roads or through forest trails and so on. There are different types of bike packing. Um, as you can see here, the picture that you can see here, this was me in uh, Oman about uh, five years ago. And uh, you can see the type of bike that I have here. This is a, a mountain bike that I was using cycling in Oman. And um, knowing now what I know about Oman was probably the wrong bicycle to bring, but I'm gonna go on now to show you. Let me see now if I can go on to the next image. Is not changing images, no. No, still not changing images, is it? No. no. That's just enlarged it. Okay, good. Well, that's it. How about Xing out of that and going back? Yeah, I've actually tried to do this several times. You see, but now I might have to completely go out. Here we go. Now you see me again? Yeah, yeah, we're all on a shared screen again. <laughs> yeah, we're back to a small little screen then. Oh, Lord. Now, but you can see that's a new bicycle there, is it? Yeah, you can't enlarge it, can you? Uh, I'll try a new share. Is yeah. that better? Perfect. Okay, great, cool. So there's different types of uh, bike packing that we do. Um, this here is a setup that I use for when I'm going on international trips and uh, when I'm cycling mostly on gravel roads or maybe asphalt roads and so on. Um, it, this bicycle here is made out of titanium and it has uh, carbon forks on it. And you can see I have lots of bags strapped all over the bicycle in the middle of the frame, on the seat post and on the handlebars. They're like the main places. Unless I was going on a very long trip, I usually would not be wearing a bag on my back. But instead, this is where I have like my tent, my sleeping bag, all my food, water and so on. Uh, another type of bike packing that we do, now let me see, is this gonna make me go out again? Yeah. This is actually gonna be quite frustrating now if I can't flip onto the next image. New share. Hmm. But what, what are you doing that, Michael? How, how did you get into this bike packing and anything? So what happened was, um, when I was younger, I was always interested in. Sorry, this isn't showing another image now. Oh my god, this is. No, you're back into the overview screen. Yeah, here we are. Um, now can you just see one bicycle there? A different type of like a racer? No, no, no. On a small screen again, and just says R three on the picture. Okay, well now here we are. 
No. Is that oh, yeah. There we go, yeah. Yeah, very good, cool. Um, so when I was younger, I was into, like, I, I did a lot of rock climbing, a lot of hiking. Um, I did a bit of mountain biking in the Wicklow Mountains and so on. But when I moved, when I trained to be a goldsmith and moved to Sweden, I had to spend a lot of time on um, building up my business in Sweden. I was newly married and then uh, I had my, my first daughter. So I spent a few years where I, I just worked. I just worked all the time. And then about seven years ago, a friend of mine called me one day and said, oh, hey, Michael, um, would you like to go on a, on, a, on a cycling trip? And I was like, oh, um, um, may I, I don't know. And he said, yeah, yeah. Um, I was in, in uh, Mongolia a few years ago and uh, I'd like to go back there cycling. Are, are you interested in coming along? And I was like, oh, I don't know. But I kind of wanted to get back into outdoor sports and I kind of wanted to get back into a, a, like a, an adventurous life like what I had before. So I said, not knowing what it was about, I said, okay, yeah, sure. So uh, as I said, it was a, I had to learn everything from the beginning again, you know, get back on a bicycle, start cycling, get fit again, and then figure out what this whole bike packing thing was about. Um, going to Mongolia, obviously we went on mountain bikes because it is quite mountainous and quite rough. Um, this bicycle that I have here, this is actually my gravel bike, and this is meant for gravel roads. And a gravel road, say in Ireland, would be more sort of like a, a forest track, you know, the... Um, the roads that they would cut through forests in order to stop fire uh, um, fires spreading through the forests and so on and also access in for for logging for for cutting down the trees the, in ireland we see them as gravel roads um but sweden here in sweden we have it they're a bit different because sweden is is huge sweden is really really big if you were to take so there's a city in the south of Sweden called Malmö. It's just across the water from uh, Copenhagen. And it's, it's, a, it's the biggest city further south in, in Sweden. If you were to rotate the country of Sweden on that city, north of Sweden would eventually end up down in the south of Italy. So you, Sweden is, is, is massive. So big with such a small population that they can't actually put asphalt on all the roads. So we have a massive road network of gravel roads. Now, many of them like uh, lead to um, dead ends. Some of them lead to small villages and towns, but I'm very lucky in, in the Stockholm, outside of the Stockholm region, there's a huge network of these roads that aren't actually dead ends, but link from place to place to place. So we have great adventures on bicycles like this one here where it's built for going maybe a little bit faster, but you can see that the wheels are quite beefy, kind of thick enough. So they're able to handle all of the, the rougher gravel and even some light mountain biking as well. Now, uh, in, a, in a minute or two, I'm gonna get onto stories and show you photographs of places where I've cycled around the world and uh, things that have happened to me. Uh, but I'm gonna show you just one or two more bicycles just to explain the different types of riding there is. Again, I have to cut out of this and go in another way again. I, I don't know how I, I can flick between um, images. Sorry about that. That is the one already. Is this loading up there now? Is this changed bicycle now? Not yet. There you go. Okay, it's come up now, has it? Green Great. bike. So you can see that this is a much more sporty bike. And this is the one that we would use for much more mountainous and proper mountain biking, bike packing. And we'd use this for like a single track through forests, not going down in the valleys, but instead of being like up high, like say cycling on uh, the Wicklow Way, something like that. This is the type of full suspension bike. Would you believe on this bicycle, I have uh, everything that I need to live for a weekend, tent, sleeping bag, food, stove, pots, everything. 
everything is all lightweight and compact and small and fits in into these bags. And then I'm just going to go. I've got to ask you how many, how many bikes you have. Um... Yeah, <laughs> N plus one. Doesn't, doesn't matter how many you have, you want one more. I have um, five. Okay. At the moment, five different bikes. Yeah. But you'll see now, now this is going to. So let me get back into this. Sorry. Yeah. Share screen. Share screen. Here we go. This here has a, a different black bicycle turned up. Yeah. Yeah. Is it full screen again? Yeah. Oh, that's good. So here we have now. This is what we I would use for winter, or in sandy conditions. And I'm actually I'm going to in a second I'm going to deviate. I'm going to tell you an adventure that I want to do. But um, so you can see this setup. This is called a fat bike, and the wheels are four inches wide on this. So you can see like this is a like quite a beefy bike. And on this one, I do actually have small panniers on the back. So in this setup here, I would have like double sleeping bags, food for maybe a week, and my tent, all my pots and pans, spare clothes, everything. So as I said, so this is what I would cycle in Sweden in the wintertime. This is meant for um, cycling on snow, but also uh, cycling on uh, sand and like rocky beaches and so on. These type of bicycles were actually invented in Alaska. And they were meant for like cycling on very rough terrain, not fast, but like sandy beaches and, um, you know, crossing shallow rivers and all, all this type of stuff. And um, I'll tell you an adventure that I'm planning at the moment, which is to cycle from the border up in uh, Newry all the way down to Rosselaire, but on the beaches. And I reckon I can link the entire eastern coastline of Ireland by only cycling. Uh, well, it'd be like 90% cycling on beaches oh. from uh, Loud down to uh, Rosselaire. Um, one of the fun parts actually would be coming to Dublin because after you cross over Sutton, you'd go on to Bull Island and then you'd go on to the Bull Harbour Walls. And um, later on, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, pack rafting, but basically I take out a small boat and paddle across and then basically bypass the entire Dublin city, but on the beaches on the, on the East Coast instead using it. Anyway, so that's, that's a fat bike and that's what I'd use for, for winters and for sandy conditions and so on. Now, I'll go on now to start talking about adventures. And so- Probably hear about that in the news, a man off the Irish coast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, no, 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 that is still what's not that a search, you, search and rescue helicopter looking for you? Yeah, so there's a new image there now, not yet. New share. There okay, you. yeah, is it up there? This is actually a picture of myself and two friends when we were in Spain. So why do we go bikepacking? What, what for? Like what, what, what is the actual aim or goal or whatever? It's basically like going hiking or it, we do it just for the sense of an adventure, you know, cause it brings us to quite spectacular and amazing places. This was a place in between uh, near Granada in, in Southeast Spain. But we went cycling here for like 10 days. Um, but like when you have scenery like this and small little tracks and lanes to cycle on in really rural Spain, it was like, I think that we only passed through like one town in the entire time, but on, we were up high in the mountains, views like this, um, amazing campsites every night, super food. You can kind of, you, you can, I don't know, maybe you can see the uh, why you would do this type of cycling. It, it's a bit different from traditional uh, cycle touring. You know, it, you, you definitely get to see more adventurous places. Pretty dangerous, no? Um, or are you staying on a track to some degree? Um, you would be, um, not that you'd be staying on a 
track but uh yeah sometimes on track sometimes on very small trails sometimes on very uh, on wide fire roads you know it's it's a, a mixture now hold on i'm going to just share the next image here now is that another image appearing yep. now perfect yeah yeah so yeah i mean it'd be like single tracks up high in the mountains it could be forest roads sometimes you dip onto asphalt roads farmers lanes you know cycling across beaches like lots lots of different varied trails but i've never had felt a danger of the trail that i was cycling that that's never been an issue uh, at all you know i've never i would never be in well, no, actually, a couple of times I have been. I'm actually going to show you some pictures. But by and large, you would never be cycling somewhere that would be a dangerous place to cycle. And um, here we have an image of some of the tools and hardware that I would bring along. Because we're in quite remote places, you can see a big amount of the things that I'm bringing are actually uh, cycling tools, you know, first aid kits. Uh, you can see my titanium pot there, gas cylinder, power banks, torches. Um, like water bottles. You can see the orange uh, parcel there, the, the real Tormat. That's uh, freeze dried food. So it's quite compact, but when you add in water, it gives you um, quite tasty, but a lot of calories, a lot of energy from these, the, these type of foods. So sometimes we buy them like this, and then other times we'll actually make our own mixtures and bring like dried foods that we'd add water to. As we're going along, um, now let me. See if I can. Did that, that close down again, did it? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. So let's just do, yeah. So the main place I would go bike packing, obviously, I would do a lot of cycling around. Is that shared now? Can you see that? Yeah, no. Is that sharing? Uh, Yes, now. There you go. Yep. So when I go cycling in Sweden, it often looks, it's not always like this, but often it, it looks like this. These like small laneways, old forest roads cutting through like fantastic forests. Um, East Sweden is not very mountainous, not at all. I think in the Stockholm County, the highest point I think is 100 meters above sea level. So it's, it's relatively flat around here, but we would do it just to explore old mining villages. There used to be a lot of mining around uh, in Sweden, uh, a lot of um, forging, making cannons, big steel cannons and gates and so on. So we do an awful lot of cycling around um, locations, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers from Stockholm. And we get to see these uh, fantastic forests and so on. Let me just... It's kind of set up for it then, really, in, in Sweden. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, cycling in Ireland. Here is a couple of years ago in the Burn. Uh, and again, like, people think that they know their local area quite well. But it's only really when you either get out walking or, or get on a bicycle and explore a bit more, you start finding all these locations that you, you just didn't know existed. You know, so, I mean, there's many people that know Ireland very well but how often would they see like a view like this you're are you uh, you can see Dave there you can see the burn no not yet oh really huh <laughs> there's me talking <laughs> there you go yeah so now now that you know it in like Claire you, you know where it is, but I mean, th this could be a very exotic location, could be in Central Asia nearly. But uh, as I said, not, not many people get to see views like this, even though we've all been to County Clare, I'm sure, many, many times. Beautiful. Now, uh, and me, what else do I do now? Let's see, I'm getting the hang of this now, I think. Yeah. So my, my first trip, as I said, my friend rang me and he said, hey, do you want to go on a bikepacking trip? I was like, what the hell is bikepacking? And he said, oh, well, you know, we put all the stuff on our bicycles and we go cycling in remote places. And we ended up in places like this. 
Is that a new image? Yeah. So this is somewhere in central um, outer Mongolia. Inner Mongolia is in China. Outer Mongolia is the country outside of China. So this is outer Mongolia, central outer Mongolia. So the tent there, that's actually called, a, a, we, we know them as yurts, but there they're called gares. And a family would live in there. And they're, they are nomads. They're, they're nomadic people. Uh, in the winter, they'll be closer to the cities. But in the summertime, they'll go off into the mountains with their herds of sheep and uh, live in these type of huts. But they're actually quite comfortable inside and quite warm. Mongolia gets cold at night because it's basically like a desert. It doesn't, well, it didn't, I don't think, it, I think it only rained on us twice when we were there, but you can see that like every evening, like there's nothing to hold the warmth in. So it gets cold at night. But yeah, they, they pack up these tents uh, into, onto the back of um, vans and then drive to a different part of the country. Uh, cycling from Mongolia was a, a fantastic uh, adventure. Now, just opening up the next image. Has anyone any questions? I, I'm, I'm going to get into the stories now in a minute. Okay. If my computer will open up. Now, here we are. I suppose, Michael, it's, it's, um, is, it, is it easy to transport those bikes um, to the different countries or is that? Yeah, so the way that we actually do it is um, we have bags, bicycle bags, that we would break down our bicycle and uh, fit them into these bags. They need to be below a certain size and then it's quite easy, like then, then, then the airplanes take it, no problem. The biggest challenge would be when we get to uh, the foreign destination, where, where do we store those bags when we're out cycling? Uh, they would be like two big suitcases side by side that's the type of size of them so actually there's a can you is do you see a new picture there with a tent in it yeah yeah so um this was actually back in spain again and um, as you can see i mean we're quite remote now in the middle of these mountains there's no way that we could have been bringing our uh bike pack and bags with us so what we did was we flew to alicante and we rented a van we the three of us put our all our luggage including bike bags in the van and then um, uh, drove to the beginning of the route. And then we spent seven days cycling in a loop and around back to the van. So we arranged at a campsite that we could leave the van there for the seven days. Uh, and I had the bags in the van. When I'm not renting a van and say, you know, when I was, when we were in Mongolia, for instance, the first night we were there, we booked into a hotel. We arranged to leave our bike bags there. And then the last night before you fly out, you go back to the same hotel, stay there for one or two nights or whatever, and then uh, break your bicycles back down, put them into the bags, and then like pay them a bit extra. And then they take you to the airport to, um, to fly home. So, uh, other pretty exciting places I've been to. Is this changed again? Yep. Image changed? Yeah, bike and uh, cliff. And like the Grand Canyon. Cliffhanger. Yeah, which is actually not. This was, this was in Oman. Um, like when we think about Oman, normally you would think about like just desert and like typical sandy desert and so on. But uh, outside of Muscat, there is a, a really great um, mountain range. And in the mountain range, it's like there's these huge um, wadis or basically canyons. And um, I knew that they existed, but I was very surprised when I uh, found this place here. I mean, I actually camped here for the night. Absolutely like surreal, fantastic location. Nobody around. There was a village, you know, a kilometer or two behind me, but otherwise I had this view to myself for the for the entire evening. It was just uh, absolutely fantastic. So I'm sure you're you're kind of wondering, like, how do you do you find these places? You know, what how do you decide where where to go? Um and it's really just researching and looking around the internet and reading books. You know, I went to Oman because I wanted a trip to do in the winter time 
And my auntie and uncle had lived in Oman many years ago, and they said that it was a fantastic place. So I bought the Lonely Planet Guide, read through the guide, and there was one paragraph in that entire book that spoke about a four by four trail that's only 70 kilometers long, but you need nearly two days to drive it. And I was like, that sounds like a great adventure. So um, just off of that road was where I came across that canyon. So th that was the basis of my trip. You can see here, uh, the next image, is that a picture of one guy on a bicycle on yeah. a dirt road? Yeah. Yeah, this is in the uh, Caucasus Mountains in South Georgia, the country in between uh, Turkey and Russia, I suppose. Georgia, Azerbaijan and Armenia are the three countries there. This was in the middle of Georgia. Um, I was uh, there cycling actually, and I decided to take a detour because I came across an American cyclist who had just cycled through the area. And he spoke about a village where there was, um, all the houses had like grass roofs and it was really like an untouched, like Soviet inspired uh, Georgian village. And I was like, I, I definitely have to go there. So I was cycling down the road that, that you see there. And uh, these two guys stopped in a car and like, they looked pretty dodgy. And I was like, oh no, I hope I'm not gonna get hassled here. But they were actually really nice and they were like oh, like they didn't have any english but they were like coffee coffee come 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 so the guy asked me to um go to his house is there another image appeared yeah, yeah. this was his house in this village you know and i was like uh you know something i'm here for adventure i you know it's not just a pure cycling trip this is a you know, I, I'm exploring. I, I, I want to see these things, you know. So, you know, something I'm going to go in, I'm going to sit down with these guys, and I'm going to have some, some coffee. And um, so, in, in, in I went, and um, this is like people live in these type of houses like full time. This was the inside of the house. Has that changed? Yeah. Yeah, like, it, it, this looks like Ireland from like 100 years ago. Sure but, yeah, but this was actually just like three years ago in, 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 in the middle of Georgia. And this is how, in fact, his mother lives here full time. The guy was from the village, but had left Georgia and went to uh, live and work in Russia. And you can see up on the wall there, there's a picture of a man. That was his father. And he had just come home to help his mother basically like bury the father and get find her feet again and get and get uh, going. But I'll be honest, the guy looked dodgy. Like he looked like someone that would murder you, you know? But he was he was really, really nice. But he now he he didn't have any any English, but and he wanted to say a lot of things to me. So he had this like a contraption in, in his room and it was actually, it was a car wing mirror that he put his phone on and somehow it helped him pick up his neighbor's Wi-Fi. You can see it there. Okay. <laughs> Wow. So what actually happened was we spent like about an hour drinking coffee and he would speak Russian into his phone to Google Translate. And then the phone would speak back to me in English. Wow. But it was, and you know, so, and that's how I found out a couple of things, you know. And then he said to me, you know, I, I, I found out about their life in Georgia and he was home uh, building a, a monument for his father, which apparently is, is, is a dumb thing to do there. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't question him so much. And then he said, oh, you have to come fishing with us. And I was like, oh, okay. Now, where he was, was right on the lake. So to be honest, I thought he meant he'd be take out a fishing rod and walk down to the end of his garden and go fishing from the, uh, the bottom of his garden. But actually myself and his friend 
and him jumped into a car and we drove for, it felt like forever. It's like a half an hour. He kept on getting lost. I was starting to get a bit worried being in this like strange guy's car in like, he looks like a mass murderer, like in the middle of Georgia. And I was like, oh, what's going to go on here? But uh, as we were going to the fishing place, one of the reasons why it took so long, the guy kept on stopping off in people's houses and like giving them boxes of cigarettes and like a can of beer and like just lots of different gifts, I suppose. And I, I, I wasn't too sure what was going on, but you know, something I was like, Michael, you're, you're, you're here for an adventure. Just, um, you know, play along, go along. But anyway, we, we did end up at, at the lake and uh, we went fishing. And what, what would happen is that there was a bunch of guys there. One of them would paddle out in a little boat and drag this net behind him. And then he'd paddle back into the shore and then we would uh, scoop in everything that was found in, in, in the net, um, and which was actually um, quite a bit. You see there now another? Yeah. So there are these little fish. So apparently they would fish in these high mountain lakes. They would get all of these fish and then use it for bait when they go down to the sea. Uh, Them, them loading it in. Very good. So what I figured out was that my host, the very scary Russian speaking guy, was um, he was from the village but had moved to Georgia. And all these other guys who we met, which is appearing now, these were all local lads that were there making a living. And this guy has come back from Russia, has way more money than everybody else, but wants to hang out with the lads, back to like his childhood friends. So when we uh, uh, turned up at this fishing meet, my host had brought a big box of food that, you know, you see the bottles of beer, there was like um, dried sausage, there was, uh, you know, uh, different meats and cucumbers and so on. And actually what we did was, you can actually see just above the number plate, there's a cucumber standing there they would use a big knife and chop off a section of the cucumber and then carve out the middle of it and then pour vodka into the, the, the scooped out part. And then you do a shot of vodka and then eat the cucumber. And I was like, yeah, well, this is a, definitely a different way. But I mean, it was like a fantastic experience, you know? And um, the strange thing was that when they got all the fish, they then went along and they threw it in the back of, the, of a big van, but they put it in this rubber boat that they were using to, catch, to paddle out to catch the fish. And that's, okay, can you see that now, the boat? Yeah. So, and this is how, like, so they, they would just throw it all in the back of the van and uh, in this boat. And I was like, that's really weird. Why not just keep them in buckets or something? I don't know. But anyway, the fishing was over. And we went back to his house. And this guy had been tanking back all of the vodka. And uh, he, he, he started getting drunk. And he started, you know, babbling on, but without using the phone to translate. And I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And he kept on trying to get me to, to stay, stay the night, you know, sleep on my floor here, you know, it'll be great. And I'm like, no way, <laughs> you know, I just, there's no way that I'm spending like a drunken night with this guy, you know, in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, you know, and I was like, look, I have to go to my next destination. I, I wanted to go to a different part of Georgia just to see this, uh, an old monastery. And he said, look, don't worry about it. I'll arrange for someone to give you a lift. You know, time was ticking on, you know, and then suddenly like it's, it's half past five and I know it's going to be dark in an hour. And I'm still in this guy's house. I'm like, oh, shit, I, I hope I'm not going to get trapped here. But what happened last minute, the van turned up that had all the fish in the boat in the back. And I was like, uh, oh, OK, great. And it was like, this guy here is going to bring you where, you're, where you want to go. I was like, OK. So we opened up the back of the van and I, I, I throw my, my bicycle in the back. 
and uh, we start driving and the guy decides to take me on the scenic route, which is literally up over the mountains uh, on really small lanes, like roads that I'd be find adventurous to cycle on. This guy wanted to drive down them all. And I was like, oh, all right. But it, it was quite steep going up this hill. And he'd, he'd, he'd drive up and then the van would get stuck. An old like 1960s Russian, I didn't even know what the make was. And then the next thing would start rolling back down the hill. And then he'd try to go up a different path and different laneway. And it was just, I was like, oh my God, what's, what's happening here? His windscreen was so dirty and the sun was so low in the sky at this point that he, we couldn't see at the window. So we had to drive the van with standing outside of the van. Can you see that picture there? Yeah. This is how we were driving over the mountains. Like, so there's me and this guy in this 1960s Russian vehicle with my bike in the back of the van and the boat full of the fish. And I was like, oh my God, what is going on? So when we get to the top, of course, you have to go down the other side. And we started going down this really steep embankment. And it get, it's getting steeper and steeper and steeper. And at the bottom of it, there's a river. And I'm like, this guy has to slow down. If he doesn't slow down now, like we're going to go into this river, you know? And uh, it got to the point where we both started shouting at each other and then nearly grabbing each other as he's pumping the brakes. And luckily, the brakes kicked in just before the river and he swerved and we missed the river. But like we're doing all this and at this, while this is all happening, I'm thinking I'm going to die. I'm actually really thinking about all the fish in the back of the van and how it's going to go all over my bicycle. My bicycle is going to smell of fish for the next, like for the rest of the trip. But anyway, we didn't crash. We got out of it and uh, he drove on and it turned out he was a really, really nice guy. And he lived in the town where I was going to next because I wanted to go and see um, this monument. One of the main reasons why I went to Georgia is that I wanted to see this uh, old monastery. Is a new picture appeared there? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Vardisi, I think it's called, and it's near the Turkish border. And this was a monastery that was built into the mountain. And when it was originally built, you wouldn't have seen anything, but there was like an earthquake about 200 years ago and half the mountain fell away and revealing all the rooms that are there. But um, I'll show you now the next part. You can see the size and the scale of it. Gee, well. And uh, inside, like there's churches built into the mountain and tunnels and passageways. And it's like half a fort and half a religious center. But like places like this where, you know, from these adventures that I do, like you get to find these places and they are um, fantastic. Now I know that I'm getting on in time. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some, um, how I find the routes. Uh, here's another picture appearing now. Yeah. So this is actually um, an old quarry about two hour, two and a half hours drive from Stockholm. And the reason why the, the water is turquoise is because I think it was like a limestone quarry. Um, it, it's in the county of Dalarna, just north of Stockholm. I decided that we wanted to go and do, uh, myself and some friends last October, we went in and we did a tour here. And um, what I do is I go into Google Earth and Google Maps and uh, start working out, you know, points of interest, places where we want to go and so on. And uh, when I was doing it, I came across this image here. So using Strava, which is like a, a, an app that you can use for measuring how far you cycle and so on, using their maps. I, I was looking at this section of river and I was like, hold on, there's tracks on one side and there's tracks on the other side and there's nothing in between. I, I wonder how do people get across the river, you know? So um, I then switched onto the satellite version of the, of the map. Has that turned up now a forest? Yeah. And I was like, oh, what is that in, in the river, in the middle? I was like, could, could that be how people get across the water? And lo and behold, we kind of took a risk and we uh, cycled there 
and excellent well we came to this so this is how we uh, got across the water. So on my bikepacking adventures, we um, like just mixture of stumbling across these things, or, you know, sometimes it's by chance or not. And we end up having these just amazing adventures in these surreal situations. And um, often it works out perfect and it's, it's great. And you get across the river, the obstacle or so on, but then sometimes you end up in situations like this. So this here is, you can see all the sand there. Yeah. So this is actually on the island of Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands. And I tried so hard to make a route work that I kind of just took a chance. I was like, oh, it'll be fine. I'll just turn up, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And um, so um, I went on the tour and I ended up having to cycle in inverted commas through sections uh, like this. Later on, on the same day, uh, I thought I was past all the hard parts and uh, I basically passed all the hard parts and then jumped down on the beach to cycle, half walk along. See this one turning up now at the beach? Yeah. 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 So it was, uh, I mean, fantastic situation. Nobody in the middle of like the west coast of, you know, Fort Ventura, Canary Islands, desert, no natural growth or anything. And I was like, this was fantastic. But as I was walking down the beach, I came across two men fishing and they actually worked in a local hotel and they were shocked to see me on this beach. And they were like, why are you on this beach? Like, what, what's, you know, what are you doing cycling here? And I was like, oh, I'm cycling up the West Coast. I'm having a great time. And they said like, one hour ago, there was no beach. This is like a tidal beach, you know? So if I had been an hour earlier, it would have been just water, the entire beach there. So sometimes you're, you're, you're just lucky about uh, uh, on the adventures and uh, things things do work out. Um, other times you are on existing trails, but the trails are really, really hard. Here's one that we just weren't cycling up, but instead we had to spend about a kilometer of pushing up this old uh, road. Pretty, pretty uh, savage gradient. Looks like the trees are struggling to even grow straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then other times you really stumble across some weird and amazing things. Um, I went on a trip in Latvia. Latvia is only across the water from Stockholm. So in fact, what it was, was that we got on the ferry on a Friday evening, an overnight ferry. It like kind of like the one that you would take going to say Liverpool, that all the, all the truckers would take from Dublin. So we, we took like this uh, transport uh, ferry over to Ventspils in Latvia. And again, the aim was to cycle like a hundred kilometers down this beach uh, on the west coast of Latvia. Latvia, as we know, was part of the Soviet Union. And during the Cold War times, like that was like the front of the, of the Soviet empire that faced onto the west. So it was built with loads of um, forts like and uh, like military installations, nobody was allowed to live there because it was all like uh, deemed to be um, top secret and uh, sensitive information. In fact, as you can see along the trail, we started seeing buildings like this, like something directly out of a James Bond movie, apparently for listening for science in outer space, but obviously um, really for listening in on the West to see what was happening. Um, this was that was still in use, but we then started finding these type of compounds, which was definitely looked like something out of um, Star Wars. Well, there, there was an entire uh, bunker complex on underneath this building. Uh, that we could actually go in and walk around. So it was just basically abandoned and people had come in and robbed out all the metals and you know the copper wiring, the metals and the rest of it was just left like this. We were coming across entire abandoned villages like apartment blocks and everything that they were just there. 
like people had robbed out the windows and the doors and stripped out all the metals but they were just still existing and like you had towers like this we actually climbed up that tower and we we're in the like the control room up on the top of the tower and uh yeah so the bike packing it definitely brings you to these pretty um special uh locations very good Michael, I think we better uh, yeah. end. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I think it was absolutely fascinating. Well done. Your, I think pictures paint a thousand words for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, it was a bit slow to get started. Sorry about that now that right. I couldn't figure out how to yeah. get through it. But yeah. So who's bike packing then? I've, I've got a question on uh, gear, if I can. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I've spotted on all your bikes, you've got cleats, and I think they're yeah. fantastic. Cleats, yes. But on mountain bikes, they frighten me. I don't yeah. use cleats on so mountain bikes. So actually, bike. yeah, it's do, do I use cleats or do I use flats? Um, the answer is I actually use both, it depending on what where I am and what I'm doing. Yeah. So if I'm doing like really technical riding, but in the dry, I would use cleats. Uh, I would basically, that means that I would clip into the pedals. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because you definitely have better control on the bike. If I was doing like at the moment in Stockholm where there's, um, there's um, ice on the ground and there's a chance of the bike slipping, you know? So I actually have different bicycles. Some of my bicycles I have um, uh, spiky tires, like have um, uh, spikes on them. And then some of them I don't. If I'm cycling a bicycle this time of the year, that doesn't have the spikes in it. I, I, and if I'm cycling like really, really long distances, then I won't use uh, clip-ins either because it's good to be able to change the positioning of your foot to save your, your knees. Great. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Russian guy who I met in Georgia, when he was getting really, really drunk, he kept on saying to me, I'm I'm Robbie Oud. And I was like, what, what's he trying to say to me? I, I don't know. And I finally figured out that he was actually Robin Hood. And I also figured out that he actually was Russian mafia and he was hiding in Georgia for his life because he must have done something wrong. So he wasn't there to look after his mother at all. He was literally hiding from Russian mafia. And when, he, when we were out fishing, he'd taken off his top. And there was like bullet holes and marks on his body. And I figured that he must have been involved in the Georgian war against Russia. No, he was living in Russia. He was actually mafia guy who'd been shot and stuff. Wow. Another reason why I didn't want to spend the night in his house. Yeah, I think that was a very, <laughs> very good call. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if, if nobody else has any more questions, I think we'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Yeah, sure. Really yeah. interesting. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Michael. Thanks, very Michael. enjoyable. Very good. Great.